feel very fortunate to have Sally Singer, that she was willing to come here tonight and put together this amazing panel of Los Angeles's leading designers to talk about their response to the extraordinary environmental and economic changes that the world is going through. Our panel is Tom Ben, Christina Kim from DOSA, Adriana Goldschmidt of Goldsign, and Catherine Malevi of Rodarte. Um, Sally Singer is the fashion news and features editor at Vogue, and she'll be introduced by her great friend, Mona Simpson. Mona, as you know, is the acclaimed essayist and novelist and author of Anywhere But Here, The Lost Father, A Regular Guy, and Off Keck Road. And she's also a professor of English here at UCLA. So please join me in welcoming Mona Simpson. There is a story by the great Canadian writer Alice Munro in which a housekeeper who looks like, quote, a plain-clothes nun goes into a small-town dress shop called Milady's to buy herself an outfit to get married in. The man she's hoping to marry hasn't exactly proposed yet. Right inside the store is a full-length mirror which shows a few inches of her lumpy bare legs above the ankle socks. She thinks, they did this on purpose, of course. They set the mirror right there so you could get a proper notion of your deficiencies right away, and then they hoped you would jump to the conclusion you had to buy something to alter the picture. This is how many of us feel entering the world of fashion. Joanna, the housekeeper, went into the store because she'd seen a suit in the window, a green suit with velvet cuffs and collar and a little velvet buttons. She tries it on in a size 14. The fit was all right, Monroe writes. There was no problem with the suit. It was what, struck, it was what stuck out of it, her neck and her face and her big hands and her thick legs. Then the store owner says, you have large bones, what's the matter with that? Dinky little velvet colored buttons are not for you. Don't bother with it anymore, take it off. She hands in a garment through the dressing room curtain. Just slip on this on for the heck of it. A brown dress, about as plain as you could get, except for a narrow gold belt. This time, she didn't look as if she'd been stuck into the garment for a joke. It wasn't that she started thinking she was pretty or anything, just that her eyes were a nice color, if they had been a piece of cloth. When she took the dress off for the storekeeper to wrap it in tissue, she was sorry to, lo sorry to lose the soft weight of the skirt and the discreet ribbon of gold around her waist. Joanna had never in her life had this silly feeling of being enhanced by what she had put on herself. That parable of the benevolent fairy describes my and many women's relationship to Sally Singer. Sally Singer grew up in California and was a child fanatical about home sewing. I didn't come from a family with the means to actually purchase anything that would constitute fashion, she said in an interview. But by the time she was 11, she could tell you the names of every photographer and bookings editor She'd memorized the masthead of every fashion magazine. And from Oakland, she sent a handwritten letter to Andy Warhol because she wanted to work at interview. I was a nightclub kid who had grown up in the middle of nowhere, she said. From that, I take it to mean her time in Orange County, from which she took buses up to the Whiskey Bar, Starwood, Madame Wong's, and the Odyssey. She dropped out of high school, took the GED, Later, she dropped out of Berkeley to go to beauty school, where she studied the color wheel, the California curl, the Marcel wave, and learned to wax ladies' lips. But she dropped out of that, too, because I was terrible, she said, and it's a terrible thing to be terrible at. <laughs> Sally did what others might call dropping up. After beauty school, she went to Yale for graduate work in American studies. She dropped out of Yale to work at Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux editing books while waitressing at the bottom line, which tells you something about the economics of book publishing. She worked there on a first novel called This is the Life by a young Irish lawyer, and she married him. They lived in London for four years. He worked as a lawyer, also defending death penalty rights, death, death, death row rights, of 
convicts, and she worked for the London Review of Books and British Vogue. Then they moved to New York, where she's been at Vogue for 10 years as the fashion news feature editor. That's a mouthful. Doing a job, she does a job that used to be held by two people, merging fashion and features. She's covered Alice Waters' edible schoolyard project and was the first and ran the first major feature on Nancy Pelosi. In the blog world, JD says, I'm in love with Sally Singer. Brian Boy elects her complimentarily, slut of the day. One vague Vogue staffer claims, all of us girls look to see what Sally is wearing. She has not read or seen The Devil Wears Prada. Although she reads a lot of fiction, two or three novels a week, and for years she was the primary reader for her husband Joseph O'Neill while he worked on the novel Netherland, published last year to become the most deservedly critically acclaimed book of 2008 here and in the UK. As Claudia said, Joe will be reading here tomorrow night at 7, and his short story, which is in this month's Harper's Magazine, is I hope you received with your tickets tonight. Like Sally, we're hoping to merge the world of words with fashion. For the last two years, America's Views section has given out the message, this is a quote from Sally, buy less, buy better, and don't think fas fast fashion is the fix for your life. She says it's their mission to be as relevant as possible and yet to keep up the dream of Vogue. Michelle Obama, as Sally points out, is not a size zero. I hope all those Hollywood actresses realize that they don't need a giant neck necklace and cantilevered cleavage to go to an awards show, she wrote. Thank God someone understands just wear something you look pretty in. For those of us who did go to see The Devil Wears Prada, the fashion world can seem to emphasize the most daunting elements of female nature as viewed in seventh grade classes, hierarchy, intimidation, the rule of the rich and the beautiful. But Sally Singer represents an alternative vision, one of artistry and forgiveness. She's a great friend, imaginative and generous. Fashion is one of the great elixirs, she says, a great fun thing people can do to pick themselves up at whatever le level they choose to engage in it. Here's my final example of Sally's great generosity. This is from a Q&A run in USA Today some years ago. A woman from LA wrote in, all my friends spent, sport the latest styles and trends, but I myself am very busty and very hippie. All my friends say how, the, how, the, how low-rise jeans would help my hips look more flattering. Is this true? Sally wrote, Dear LA, low-rise jeans can give the illusion of a longer torso, and this can be helpful in making the hourglass shape look leaner and more modern. That said, low-rise jeans can also emphasize wide thighs, not always a good thing. It's a tricky question. Certain labels sit just below the natural waistline and therefore flatter the greatest number of body types. In terms of spring looks, you might consider adding a curvy small jacket to your wardrobe. Think small shouldered on top and A-line on the bottom. There are a lot of good pieces out there for you. Fashion, in Sally Singer's words, is a means of setting the world more fair on an extremely basic level, making beauty, even physical beauty, possible for everyone. Thank you. When, when Mona and Claudia from The Hammer first spoke to me about doing a panel, um, it was a number of months ago, it was quite some time ago, probably early fall or even late summer. And at the time, I, I thought the most relevant question to ask, and it's a question that, or an issue, that people who work in design and, and people who work in my world had been talking about and mulling over for quite some time was what do you do when you have, if you're a designer, when you have an urge or a twitch or a compulsion to make things in a world that doesn't need any more things? And you know it doesn't need any more things and yet every day you wake up and there's something that you want to sketch or you want to sculpt or you want to cut from cloth how do you do it? Um, why you do it is obvious. It's because you're an artist and, and you believe that has a role in the world. But how do you do it in a way that squares with your other ethical concerns and, and your idea of, of, of yourself as a citizen of a larger world? And, and so that was, the, that was the question I thought was 
worth addressing here. And the four people that I brought here tonight, who are really the wonderful people who will be speaking tonight, and I, I'll be doing very short introductions to them, and, and yet their introduction should be as kind of amazing and Googled as Mona's of mine. Um, they're, they're all people who in their work, um, I think, have, have have thought a lot about that issue. Not not all because not only because they do sustainable work and that everything they do is organic or everything is eco, but the terms in which they work show a sensitivity to to producing things, clothes, luxury goods now, and thinking hard about what luxury means. So that's where it was when this panel started. And then um, there's been a slight economic collapse, which we all might have read about somewhere. And it hit all industries very hard, but it certainly hit the fashion industry quite hard as well. Um, going into Christmas, we saw uh, record job losses in fashion uh, in, in all aspects of it, from retail to production and, and globally, not just here. The, the sort of deep discounting, those incredible sales that everyone wanted to shop before the holidays have really wreaked havoc. Um, the, the change in the, in the value of the dollar, um, which was very weak when most of the designers working now bought their fabrics for the collections, which they're now presenting, and now the dollar's risen, and it, everything has worked against them. So right now, there's a whole other issue of sustainability, which is how does this industry sustain itself through this economic downturn, and how does it start to rethink its ways of working so that it can simply survive without, again, resorting to um, faster, cheaper, and more of the same. So I think it's actually sustainability has a kind of double meaning here tonight, and it has a double meaning for the people um, who are gonna, who I'm going to bring out, the four designers I'm going to bring out, all of whom, all of whom work in Los Angeles, um, and all of whom came to Los Angeles at a certain point in their careers. They're not actually from here originally. Uh, only the Malivis are from California. Catherine Malivi from Rodarte, who'll be coming out. I should say that, funnily enough, I'm quite optimistic in terms of fashion for what this period will bring. And I mean, I, I, I'm optimistic because um, people, such as the designers who I'm bringing out tonight, are working in the industry, and I think their answers, are, their answers to how to get through this are going to be very interesting and worth seeing. But also, I think that Great, great innovations come through during tougher times, particularly in fashion. It's during, you know, it's, it's in tough times that self-expression becomes all the more interesting and all the more important. I mean, the one thing you can always do is kind of dress like a peacock, no matter what's going on, and, you know, remake your wardrobe uh, just from what's in your closet. So I'm hoping that, in, that some of the... some of the areas in which this indus the, indus the fashion industry has been a bit negligent or a bit, um, has, has, has sought too easy answers, that they'll sort of, res they'll, um, they'll sort of slip away and a new set of answers will emerge that are interesting and tonight is one way to start thinking about that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call the people on the panel at one at, the, at a time and they're going to show a little projection of their work, a little slideshow. Now, I only, one of these projections arrived about five minutes to seven, and we're going to hope it's going to work. And the, and the others I haven't actually reviewed, so it'll be new to me too. And they're going to, in doing it, they're going to talk a little bit about what they do. And when they're all up here, we'll have a few more questions, and then we'll open it up so that you can all ask them anything you'd like, and myself as well. So the first person who's going to come up is um, Catherine Malivi, Kate Malivi from Rodarte. She and her sister Laura founded Rodarte in 2005. They're based in Pasadena. They work in downtown Los Angeles now. They work with, I think, half an assistant maybe, one assistant. Um, and yet they manage to um, dress stars for the Oscars, put on a show in New York every season that is without question one of the most important shows in New York, and indeed one of the most important shows internationally right now for fashion. Their collection is sold at um, the, the, the very best stores, and from a very kind of small place of, of handcraft and two girls figuring out how to sew the clothes they want to sew after graduating from Berkeley in, I believe, literature and art history, they've managed to build one of the most 
um, important luxury brands out there today. Um, so. I know that we're supposed to be talking about very serious um, ethical issues, but I, I want to just open by asking, by a, congratulating you on Natalie Portman's dress last night, and indeed Reese, Reese Witherspoon's as well. Mm -hmm. right. How important is that to your work, and how important did, how important is that sort of branding now? Well, I think that in the beginning, what was interesting is because we were working in LA, the first things that anyone ever told us was like, oh my God, you have to dress, you know, celebrities. And Laura and I reacted immediately against that. We actually thought the worst thing that we could do was do that right away because we actually wanted people to kind of understand what our work was and not have kind of, there's an immediacy that happens when you do that. And we felt like it would be too fast to have that happen. So we kind of stayed a little bit removed from that. And then slowly as our collections developed, it, that became kind of a natural process. But I think for us, it's not really about someone being famous. It's more about someone that's interesting um, or provocative. I think that in a certain sense that if you just rely on the fact that someone has, you know, is a star or has kind of, you know, is known as a celebrity, I think that falls flat in a certain way and becomes boring. People have seen that so much. So for us, I mean, at least going into doing the Oscars, I think that um, I'll, like, to be completely honest, I had no idea it was such a big deal. I knew that it was big for us because we've never done anything kind of on that level. But what was funny to me was everything that went behind the scenes of it. We were basically fixing a dress in a garage. It was totally, like, anti what that entire ceremony is like. And actually even watching it, we watched it at my parents' house last night, and we have a fuzzy TV, and I invited all these people <laughs> over to see it. And my dad said to me, you can't have your friends over. Like, your TV is, we can't even watch it. So I felt like the whole reality of what happened in terms of doing a dress like that from the reality at Laura and I have is so vastly different that it kind of seems surreal to me. But I, I think that there is a huge, it is important. I mean, in a sense, it's like this is the first time we've ever done anything where we got emails the next day being like, can we buy a dress? That's yeah. never happened to us. So I do feel like, in a sense, Obviously, there's a certain power that's located with that, but I think it's a mistake to um, locate any creativity or um, too much importance on it. But I guess from an you know from a business standpoint, I mean it's, I mean like I said, we've never had emails being like we want to buy this dress right Is away. Is that or, the first time? Because you've dressed celebrities before. Mm -hmm. Is this the first time you made a dress that wasn't on a runway that didn't? Because you've dressed Kira Knightley for her premieres before, and you've dressed Natalie many times, but they were always dresses that were known to the fashion world. Is this the first time well, you specifically first, dressed? The first dress that we did that was kind of a custom thing, we worked with Tilda Swinton when she was doing the Benjamin Buttons premiere. And that was really cool because she's just a really rad person, and she basically um, asked us to do a dress. And she's the coolest because, you know, she asked us like five months before that premiere, and she went through fittings, and she understands a process that's very different actually than any experience we've had with anyone else. But um, that was the first time we had done anything that was more of a custom for someone that's well known. And then doing these dresses, um, it was like that. I mean, it, they, were, they weren't pieces we had shown on our runway before. So should we, let's, uh, I want to, can we play the very late arriving Rodarte film? So now this is, looks, this is, the last three seasons, it's going to start, where, where are we going to start here? Tell me. Um, well, we'll probably start with, um, there are three shows. The first one was, I have to see. Okay, this was our, not this season, but the season before. Um, what was the theme of that collection? Well, that collection was pretty much inspired by, um, well, basically Laura and I were inspired by this idea of, we were obsessed with the film Donnie Darko and science fiction. So um, the entire collection was based off this idea of um, remnants and skeletal forms and what would be, you know, what would exist if, you know, it was the end of the world. But Laura and I, instead of being futurist, were mo more located in kind of a human, kind of, you know, this idea of what remnants would be and what would be kind of like these skeletal shapes. And that was that whole collection. So I know sometimes we talk about our collections, I feel like the ideas are strange, but they're not really, it made a lot of sense to us at the time. And we were really obsessed with, <laughs> we were really obsessed with films like Star Wars, and that's where the color palette for the short show came from. Amazing dresses. And now this, coming forward, are we going to get to? This is, this is our new, the new show. This is okay, our so this show. was shown in New York last Tuesday. Yeah. 
And you'll see it's short. So tell me about how you made this and how, how you work. Because these, the, these are leathers, some of these are marbleized leathers that were painted in Portland, Oregon. Is that correct? Yeah, the whole show. Um, this collection was actually kind of, I had the idea, uh, we were driving on the freeway and I saw all this insulation on the side of the ro road and I thought it would be cool to do a collection that was kind of inspired by Gordon Matta Clark and the idea of a deconstructed house. And then um, in our minds, we linked that immediately to Frankenstein. And so, <laughs> which is actually a really horrible thing to tell beauty editors, I realized. <laughs> but um, we, um, we pretty much built the whole, whole show because of that out of leather. And so the way we did it was we either silk screened the leather or we marbled, we had someone that hand marbled it, this woman in Portland. And then um, all the fabrics were marbled by hand. Um, and we just basically stitched the whole thing together like it was, you know, stitched up. I mean, to me, it was like also kind of like, um, you know, just pieced together and this idea of creating kind of something that was very um, logical, but at the same time kind of erratic. And uh, that's what this is. Can you explain a little about how you and your sister work and how, how you make the pieces? Um, well, I think that every season's a little bit different. Laura and I are kind of like one person, so actually it's really weird that she's not here because we're always together. And <laughs> when, we, when we work on a collection, usually we sit and we, I would say we sketch for about maybe a month or two. Um, usually the whole idea of the collection is kind of in both of our heads. And at that time, a lot of it is spent just kind of really figuring out where we want to go with the pieces. And we're really particular about how we work on a piece. Like for us, it's the biggest struggle, I think, has been to understand or digest how to build um, a full collection versus obsessing over one piece. And I think for us, that was kind of our biggest struggle because we're the kind of designers that like really, really care about one look or one idea. And we have to force ourselves into you know, understanding that there's a larger picture. And I think that that's where I've seen our collection shift more. but. Um, then we just start working. Usually after that, we kind of just start, you know, we actually don't like, we just jump into the process. We don't like building um, a lot of, you know, I think a lot of designers work more in terms of um, building things and reconstructing them and developing them. Laura and I like to spend all this time working on paper and in our heads, and then we execute it. And, um, you know, the draping and all those things, it's just as between the two of us just kind of working through the ideas and. Um, that's just, and I would say we work more last minute. We tend to be um, definitely, you know, everyone says you shouldn't procrastinate, but we're definitely like that, and it works to our advantage, so I don't know. But, you know, one thing you said after, uh, after this show, this collection is, is quite singular in its silhouette, which means that every, every dress goes to about the middle of the, the top of the thigh, mm -hmm. and... Um, it doesn't have, it isn't what we call in fashion a full wardrobe. There isn't like a pant if you need to wear it with a pant, right? There's the leather yeah. boot that goes up your leg. Well, we had a joke on. about the pant because we thought going into it, we had made pants. And I said, I don't want to do pants in the show. I actually, I'm so sick of pants. What the funny thing is, is Laura and I would never wear dresses or skirts. So it's amazing to me that like, <laughs> we, in our own lives. But I said to Laura, like, you know, all anyone wants to talk about is the economy. We don't sell our pants anyway, so screw it. We're not going to make them. Yeah. <laughs> And you said the same thing about a trench coat. This is the season where yeah. you don't have to do a trench yeah. coat because... So in a way, have you been able to... The way you work perfectly fits right, right now where the economy is. Well, I think that what was different for us was focusing on the silhouette because I think, as I was saying earlier, is that we tend to be, if you look at any of our you know, older collections, it would be um, that whatever silhouette we want to do, we just do it. So we're not confined by a silhouette. Um, I think that that's not really natural to us. But going into the show, I think the ideas, at least in my mind, um, were constricted to understanding that there was a specific silhouette. And that was a different direction for us. Um, but I like the context of working with something that's kind of constricted. It allowed us to play out um, and do things that were different than maybe that. Um, and to also, I think, kind of further, um, I, it just allowed us to kind of grow as a designer, in a sense, to, you know, to constrict yourself kind of allows that, I guess. But usually we tend to be more um, free in a certain way, and this was really, really different for us. But I felt like working on this collection was a lot more ad advanced in a sense because of that. And, and how much does the response from 
the commercial side affect what you do? Because it is, it is a funny time right now. Well, I think that, you know, from the very beginning, I think the thing about our way of working is that technically I don't think any of this should have ever happened to us. Like, really, when I think about it, I'm like, you know, we made pieces. When we first started working, we were working out of our house. We had no, I mean, Laura and I, for us, like, to even go to New York City seemed like the biggest deal. We had, we had no concept of how the industry worked. When we first did our first buying appointments, I mean, I remember I would call my friends and ask them, like, can you come over and price our clothes? Like, everything that we did was so backwards that <laughs> now, for me, you know, it just seems like I think because of that, in a strange way, um, I'd like to say that, you know, the commercial side of things dictate, you know, dictate what we do. And I think on a certain level we are, um, because we run our own business, we're very aware of all of those things. But at the same time, it really is creatively motivated. And I think no matter, you know, what the cultural or, you know, political, you know, economic context is of the moment that you're in, if that's your, um, you know, if that's what you do, you just do those things. So for me, it would be like, we do this. And sometimes I think to myself, well, I wish we could do other things because this is kind of a drag. It's hard, you know, building a collection like this when you're independent. And there's a lot of um, pressure in terms of, you know, people see things a lot in magazines, so they assume that you have a lot more than you do. But I think that it's just what we do. So for us, it's just there isn't really a difference between now and a year ago, I don't think. In a curious way, though, the way you work, which is so artisanal, it's to, to look at uh, a garment that Kate and her sister do, it's a very much a, um, it's the most exquisite kind of mix of sort of couture skills and home economics, because I mean, we, even with these little Frankenstein dresses, you yeah. see the basting threads. I mean, yeah. there's a very much an attempt to show the handwork on every piece and to make sure that the person who's wearing it when they put it on knows that it was made by hand. And so much now that feels luxurious or seems luxurious and moving forward will have that hand to it. Don't you think? Yeah. I mean, there's a real turning away from industrial production as a Well, as I a think mark. that to me, it's like, I think of, uh, you know, it's interesting. I feel like in some ways it's um, you know, I think that it's kind of like, in my mind, it's not, I'm, I'm not someone that's limited. I have very open ideas about, um, you know, what people create and what's interesting. And to me, it, you know, the way that we work was more of a product out of the fact that we tended to design very complicated pieces. And so in order to make them or execute them, we had to do it a certain way. But at the same time, I feel like it's interesting to me. It's kind of like, you know, I was an art history major. And I was studying 20th century art. And the more that I was going through that in school, the more I became kind of obsessed with like 12th century art. And I think that there's just a lack, in, in all honesty, I think there's probably a lack of connoisseurship. I think that people consume a lot. And it's based off of, um, I mean, I guess all consumption is based off desire in a certain sense. But I think that. Um, you know, most people would look at a Yves Saint Laurent, like Mondrian dress from the 60s, a couture dress, and not understand uh, the level of complexity that was there. And, I, and that's not either good or bad. I don't think that there's any judgment there. I just think that in this time, I think there probably will be a turning away from things that are, uh, it's not that mass production's bad, it's just that things aren't really made well. You're spending a lot of money on things that have really no meaning, and it's, uh, it's really interesting to see that there's that cycle of that. And I, I think that what will happen now is there will probably be um, a move away from that, I'm sure. Because if you're going to spend money on something, it should have some kind of worth, even if it's the aura of it. I mean, I think that that's another thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be made well. It could just be interesting. But if it's not interesting, then who cares? Yeah, because you already have it, probably. <laughs> so I'm gonna, on that note, I'm going to bring out Tom Binns, um, who is an... So. She's not going anywhere. You can ask her lots of questions. Um, Tom is a Venice-based, um, Irish-born jeweler uh, who's, um, <laughs> who graduated from... Hey, come on out here, you. Mm -hmm. Graduated from Middlesex Polytechnic in 81, I read. How you doing? And uh, Tom, so while Natalie, well, while Natalie Portman was where, and Reese Witherspoon, who didn't do the red carpet but looked wonderful when she got inside 
the Oscars and did her thing, were wearing Rodarte. Um, Mrs. Obama was wearing Tom's necklace last night. You can see the pictures online. She wasn't at the Oscars. She wasn't at the Oscars. It was another event. But uh, she was wearing, we should show, can we show Tom's slides? Are they ready? Um, you'll be able to see the Mrs. Obama necklace, right? No. Pearls? No, you didn't have it Something in here? Something very like it. Oh, well, he didn't bring it. You'll probably be able to see it tomorrow, actually. Yeah, Mark Jacobs probably going to do it. But, um... <laughs> so, look. So. We, are they going to go up? But Tom, um... Tom is... Uh, Tom's work <laughs> has always been about found objects and reconstructing found objects, or a lot of it has been. Well, a question... When did you start? When work, I was a wee boy. Paste. Young. How young? Um, and also, Tom, we have to badger. <laughs> uh, maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And what made you do that? Why did you start that way? You know, that's a big question. Man. I, I don't know. You don't remember? I, mean, I always say, to meet girls. All right, well, that's a good reason. Here you go. <laughs> and it works. Uh, so basically, I'm trying to make things out of nothing, uh, find things and just reinvent them, really, is what I do. I don't really think about fashion so much because it's a very transient world. I try to think about art and value, like abstract value, I think. So um, most of these things are that's a pair of glasses. That's actually a pair of spectacles, because the Mona Lisa is a spectacle. Um, this is, uh, these are diamonds, um, but they're, it's a bit fast, isn't it? Uh, I can't talk that fast. I can think that fast, but I can't talk that fast. That says emerald. That says big fuck off diamond. You know, you know, Angelina Jolie last night wore these emeralds. And I thought, you're some punk rocker, Angela, aren't you? Because <laughs> uh, she always thinks she's a punk rocker, but uh, she's really Hollywood miss. Um, so she should have been wearing those. And this is made out of, um, the last made out of, um, <laughs> can they slow it down? Can you, can you slow right. it down? They're going to slow it down. And then I can talk about my work. Uh, no, okay. <laughs> it's gonna sort of, but but the, the the pieces that say the pieces with the 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 big fuck off diamonds and and emeralds those are, those are from you showed those last, about six last months ago. Week, yeah. About six months last, ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you were already you already felt there there yeah. was going to be the removal of luxury in that in that. Kind of. Well, I don't really think about luxury that much. What do you think about? When you did that, what did you think you meant? I was thinking about people thinking about luxury. <laughs> but I don't think about luxury. <laughs> um, because people's idea of value, you know, it's questionable. So if something says it's, if this is a diamond, then it's a diamond, right? I mean, I, that's how I think. That, you know, I go, I live in Venice. <laughs> and I go to the beach a lot, so I find things all the time. So I make these things valuable. So it's just, just you know, it's how you look at it. So, I, so a p piece of glass can be really valuable. And, and when it's just how you look at it, really. And, and, and That's when I was growing up, we didn't have diamonds. Something the Queen had. <laughs> and, and and the first pieces made, you were quite you were you were part of the you worked with Malcolm McLaren a bit and you were the original punk jewelry. Well it was just after punk stuff. So. Yeah, it was New Wave, essentially, sorry. <laughs> we're aging a bit here. <laughs> um, is and this microphone's kind of... What, what, and what <laughs> sorts of pieces were you doing I then? I sound a bit echoey. What? what sorts of pieces were you doing then? Does it make me sound like I've got an Irish accent? Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't... I'm French. <laughs> huh? Go on. What, wait, what, were you doing, what were you doing in the early 80s to now? What, 
describe your work then, how it's changed? Um, early 80s. Oh, I was in college, actually, in the early 80s. And um, they taught me how to make real jewellery. And then I rejected the whole thing. The, the, you know, wasn't where I wanted to go. So I re tried to reinvent that. And what were your first pieces like as you have them brought? Uh, a bit like all this, really. When did you start bending the forks and doing the cut? Well, that was in the 80s. Um, I don't know, I just like the idea of cutlery. Tom did like, a lot of cutlery jewelry in the 80s. Things you Very handle, influential. you know, and putting your mark and stuff. So I thought it was kind of. Well, actually, it's very sensual, I think, cutlery. So I just turned it into things. How has your work changed since you moved to Venice, since you moved to L.A.? Oh, it's a lot brighter. Um, it changes every day, actually. Not because not I'm living in Venice, but it's because um, I'm thinking all the time about stuff. Just something sets me off. Or I'll find something, and off I go. What's the, what's the most recent thing you found? I'm going to see it next week anyway. Like you know. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know? I found something brilliant actually the other day. And it just set me off. But um, I'm not telling you. <laughs> Hint. Do you know why? Why? Tell me why. Tell everyone why. Because fashion is a little... They, a lot of thieves in fashion. <laughs> so, you know, I, you get stalked all the time. I won this award, actually, a couple of years ago. And it was the worst thing that ever happened to me. It, it actually made me the marked man. He won the, um, it was the Council of Fashion Designers of America um, Accessories Designer of the Year Award, yeah, 2006. Um, but they... Um, Everybody went, oh, what's he doing? That's <laughs> so good. And that was it. Boom, ba boom, ba boom. And what happens when you see your work? Really well, you get really pissed off. <laughs> Does and it not make only you get pissed things? off, but you lose a lot of money because somebody else is stealing your work. But don't you think when people want your work, they want your work and it has a value? Uh, I you would hope integrity is a... I don't even know how to spell it, no idea. <laughs> what do you think? Integrity. Do you, do you think... No morals. But no. Do you, don't you think that the people who buy your... Don't you think Mrs. Obama, when she's wearing a Tom Bins piece, instead of wearing the big emeralds or something that Angelina did last night or any other real thing... Is but they were beautiful emeralds. Oh, yes, I they must were. say, they were stunning. <laughs> but don't you think that, that... I would love them. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Angelina would, I would give them... I really love them. And I would say, I'd put a thing on and say, these are big fucking emeralds, aren't they? <laughs> and I am fucking Angelina Jewelry. I don't know, I thought we'd have Brad Pitt have that T-shirt, really. Anyway, go ahead. On that note, I think I'm going to bring out the next person. I'm <laughs> <laughs> oh, not allowed to swear? Okay. No. Well, I'm all right. I just had a drink back there, but it's all right. <laughs> so, and then, I'm going to... I'm going to bring... I mean, this is kind of like another world. <laughs> It's like watching television, but television is watching you, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's and it's not fuzzy like Kate's television. <laughs> huh? We were very good. Oh, cool. Yeah, I so, I'm not, I don't do this sort of thing. So, and, so I work, you know, I work in a little world. Like, it's that, and then all this is something else. Trader Joe's is uh, an adventure for me. <laughs> Good. Uh, well, now Adri Adriana's going to come out. The, the Adri Adriano Goldschmidt. And we're, gonna, we're just going to... I was going to tell them about my things. Well, start talking. <laughs> you want to talk about your things? But this thing's so fast, I can't tell them anything. That's a skull in them first one. And Anna Winter wore that necklace. And everybody thought it was real. Come on. So, the next I one, say, Adriana. Yeah. Huh? So, Adriana Goldschmidt, for um, those of you who have never met him before, is probably the person responsible for whatever, je if you're wearing jeans, the jeans that you're wearing tonight. He's a, he um, 
is pretty much the father of fashion denim, I guess, for lack of a better way to describe it. He co-founded, I guess you said, you co-founded Diesel with Renzo, but you were his boss. I started Diesel. He started yeah. Diesel, yeah. started Replay, <laughs> he started um, I Goldie, he started uh, A Goldie, he started uh, AG, Adriano Goldschmidt, which is not his line anymore. He has nothing to do with that line. Um, and many, many other of the lines that we now associate with um, the history of fashion as denim as a fashion statement as opposed to denim as a utilitarian statement. And Adriana's career pretty much defines the evolution of, of denim as a fashion statement, which is kind of the most important probably development in fashion in the last I'm not 30, 150 30 years. years old. Huh? No, <laughs> it's, we're, start, we're talking 1979 to the present, uh, basically, yeah. right? Yeah. So, okay, I think Diesel started in 1979. So, and, and now he, he designs Gold Sign, um, which, so we have a set of images from you. I'd also like to know that Adriano himself never wears fashion denim. Adriano only wears like dead stock Wranglers, right? Found and Levi's, yes. And Levi's. And Levi's. Found at the flea and market. Lee. <laughs> Sometimes. So show us Sometimes. where you are here. Let's say this one is uh, probably the part that I enjoy the most. That basically is uh, working by hand. The oh, yeah. dirty work that basically is uh, to create a prototype of a gene, we, in here you see the process that is uh, the finishing, that right now is one of the most important processes in the gene. And basically, I do it uh, all the time by myself, Correct. you know, because I'm trying to, to develop new processes, bring in new ideas, uh, and so that is a thing that really you have to do it uh, by yourself, and I would say is probably the most creative part of the gene development. Because uh, the big difference, I would say, in the gene design is uh, that we are not really designers. These guys are designers. We are kind of DJs of vintage. <laughs> <laughs> Means uh, that we put in together things that are part of the tradition and the American culture and we try to put it together in a new way. And uh, that's a way that we, in some way, we design, but we're not designing something that has never been existing before. Let's say we put in together the things uh, uh, in, a different, in a different way, bringing a lot of uh, innovation. Yeah. Let's say the, the thing that is very important in the gene design is also, let's say, a the technical part, the technical part that is uh, in some way connected to the, the fabrics, uh, the method of dyeing, and uh, is uh, something that uh, uh, you learn step after step, experimenting and trying and testing, and is something that uh, uh, you need a, a lot of years of experience to learn how to process. Uh, a pro this one is my personal gene. All right. <laughs> so you see, it's nothing. What are the Levi's? Nothing. Yeah, this one is a Levi's, from and uh, you see that uh, it's nothing from? more uh, basic and simple than this. Right, no, but, uh, Let's say I came into fashion in some way by accident. I was not loving fashion nah. at all, and uh, and. Uh, I learned uh, in some way after working, I got a lot, a lot of passion. And, uh, but mostly, I would say, for the creative process, more than uh, the finished product. Sure. I mean, I'm not wearing the product that I'm designing at all. You know, those are, uh, you know, that happened? one. This one, for instance, is uh, one collection that uh, I started in the 72. And you, as you see, Basically, it was not about genes, it was about colors. So the, let's say inspiration was uh, what was happening at that time in London. And this one was my first uh, design team. This one is probably 73, 74. And uh, let's say the gene, this one is uh, my inspiration. The inspiration is uh, 
the flea markets, yeah, yeah. the history and the culture of the gene that obviously is uh, uh, about uh, the American denim, the American genes. And uh, the way that I'm working basically is uh, to research in uh, the old vintage, but also to have a creative approach. The, let's say my way of working is not, this one is also very important. This one is a Japanese flea market. Oh, yeah. And uh, you know that Japan is uh, one, uh, the country where the indigo culture is probably, uh, this one are leaves of uh, uh, indigo. And uh, Japan is a country that has uh, the longest history and tradition in indigo. Indigo, this one is uh, the way that they dye by hand. And uh, the history of uh, indigo is very, very interesting because, uh, let's say, it's been spread all over the world in the same time. And uh, this one is out of the things that I'm working, let's say, are uh, inspiration, my pictures, my books, uh, uh, things that uh, the, the look that uh, I like and that uh, I develop. Yeah. Let's say, uh, as I told you, the most important thing at the end in the gene is to understand uh, what uh, the general trend is in terms that uh, the gene is a very democratic item and uh, is not uh, designed for just a few people. Uh, just to give you a number that you understand in the world, they produce every year a billion genes. So it's not... Uh, is probably the item that uh, has uh, more success than any other. And you, you, you told me an interesting thing. You think that the genes are going to get looser in this economy. That the Yeah, let's say the, the, the way that I design, I have to say I'm very political <laughs> in terms that uh, I think, especially when uh, we design a, a, an item like the gene that basically has... Uh, a big distribution, even if you design for a small line, but conceptually is an item that uh, has a, a big public, a okay. big audience. And uh, it's very important for me to understand what the political situa situation is, what the social political and the social uh, situation is, which one are the things that they are uh, the need of the people. For instance, today, just to make an example, we are living for sure, very tough times in terms of economy, and the people is uh, very scared. They don't know what is happening. Uh, they are not used to, to, to live in a situation like that. And uh, what I feel is uh, when you are scared, you run to mama, you know? You call mama, help, okay? In a, and run to mama in the gene business means uh, uh, you go to the tradition. You go to something that you know. You go to something that you feel confident about and you feel safe about. And you, you're looking for something that is comfortable, you know, and that you know what it is. That's why, for instance, I feel like it's going to be for sure a big time for uh, the traditional American brands because people feel feels good about it. And, uh, for instance, talking about the fit, there's no question about that... Uh, when uh, a period of time like this is coming, people is looking for something that is more comfortable. So you see a very clear uh, change in the fit of the gene. The, the Bush era was about the sexy gene. Get you that, know? the Bush era was about sexy genes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this time is about something that is much more loose, much more comfortable, you know, is that, let's say, in some way, the inspiration could be the pictures of the workers of the Great Depression. You know, also the finishing, the washes, uh, is uh, about that. And uh, this one is what I call the influence uh, that is given to the design uh, about, uh, basically, the uh, political situation. And let's say that what I'm trying to do is to create a a big frame 
and then I develop uh, trying to stay in that frame, understanding what is in. Then uh, I have a very strange way of working because I design the frame and then I go to a very small detail. For instance, I design uh, the button, the rivet, uh, the very small de uh, details that they are in some way, and then I go back from there to, uh, to the other side, basically. So you reassess the frame after you've taken it all? Either. Yeah. Let's say I design, I design the frame, let's say the subject in some way, and then I go to small details, and then I put to the, together the small details. Let's say there is no rule in some way, the way that uh, you design, but let's say most of the time the, 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 the need of the people is what in some way is uh, in, inspiring. And let's say I feel that, like in the gene, you have to be able to interpret it, what uh, uh, the future is, you know, and you have to be able to give to the people the right fit, the right color, the right uh, uh, weight, or the, the right uh, uh, finish. It's an interesting time for genes. I keep thinking that they're going to make a return. You know, we had a moment where there was a kind of des designer gene moment a number of years ago when seven in those lines did so well and it sort of low cut boot cut genes were basically the rage and then there was a skinny and then the genes sort of didn't have the quite the, the the prominence in the fashion world that it had had but i i i think i keep thinking it'll be coming back because it's one item that people can buy for quite a lot of money actually in some cases you know 200 to 300 dollars mm -hmm. but they can wear it five days a week and sort of feel like they've updated their silhouette or their proportions every day for months without ever washing it or dry cleaning yes. it or doing anything to it. Because jeans people never wash their jeans, ever. Right? Basically. Let's say the maniacs. The maniacs don't wash their jeans. I mean, do you... The normal people, they wash. Do you think that? Do you think people are buying jeans in a different way now? Do you think it's going to have a... I mean, Let's you, make, you yes. make a fast product, but you think in a slow way. That's what I've always loved about you, that you... You think in very long, you know, yeah. in, in the Let's way you... Yeah, say it's no question about that uh, people today uh, are more conscious about the way they spend money. I remember my mother was telling me we don't have money to buy bad stuff. And uh, this one is probably a good approach for what is happening right now. Let's say when you buy something, you have to make sure that uh, is uh, good stuff, that is lasting the right period of time. You are not buying anymore every week. And so you are thinking that's also why, in some way, the fashion is changing, is more stable, more traditional. And let's say the innovation, in some way, is more about uh, uh, the color, is more about the finishing, is more about that. And uh, let's say uh, the economy, for sure, is changing the approach of the people in terms of buying and shopping. Honestly, what I feel is uh, that uh, what we call uh, luxury in some way, for what is regarding at least uh, the gene, is going to bring a big change. Because luxury probably is going to be, again, what it was in the past. It was uh, in some way limited. It, was, it is uh, driving, in some way, an aesthetic direction right. and uh, is not about uh, a mass production anymore. It's going to be about what like, these guys do. Yeah. Let's say that uh, designing a gene line today, <coughs> we have a different responsibility because probably we're not going to make the real business anymore but we're going to give a direction to somebody else in terms of uh, uh, using what is uh, our aesthetic. And, you know, and this one, why, to answer, for instance, your initial question about when you wake up, what you're going to do, you, you feel like to design something, but nobody needs it. Honestly, I don't think that is true, because I think that today, especially today, any kind of aesthetic work is something that is uh, helping our mind and helping our attitude and to be positive for the future. 
So this one means that uh, designing, we have a, a responsibility that is about uh, designing right to be more focused and to giving dreams to the people, even if they are not able to buy it, but at least you give a dream. And the dream is what, in my opinion, at the end is the engine of our world. Fantastic. Um, on, and on that note, I'll bring Very good. Yeah. Very <laughs> good. <laughs> um, on that note, I'll bring up Christina Kim, who runs DOSA, also a Los Angeles-based company. Also, Christina? Christina, come out here. You're on. Yeah. <laughs> Christina's going to talk a little bit about um, how your company has grown from, I believe, boxer sh Italian boxer shorts, was that maybe the start of it, to, um, in some ways, in, I would say, in my view, the most interesting kind of committed and ethical production sort of business going today in fashion anywhere, really. So um, she has, you have a slideshow that you want to take us through individually. Um, I would, this is actually a poster from the exhibit that we had last year in Bologna. Um, I was invited by the University of Bologna and City of Bologna to really do an exhibit about the work I've been doing in past 15 years, which is really focusing on using organic textiles and also really thinking about recycling and as well as handmade, which is translated in, Ita in Italian translation was a bit different than American title, which is organic recycled off the grid. And um, maybe the next slide would be good. And this was a, one of the textiles that I've been using since 2002, uh, which is called Jamdani, which is a traditional sari cloth from West Bengal. And um, this is one of those textiles that I could only buy 11 meters per pattern and color. And I realized how beautiful these textiles were, and I start saving scraps since 2002. And this is, was this exhibit um, talked about how we do recycling, which you could see it online on our website. So we'll just skip to the next slide. <laughs> And this was at a museum, music museum, which was um, built in 16th century. And I s happened to study Renaissance art, and I've always loved fresco. So I was very inspired by the building. So the exhibit kind of had um, kudos to building itself. And the pattern of Jamdani also reflected the pattern of the um, frescoes in the ceiling. Next slide, please. And this museum housed instrument, old instruments from 13th to you know, 18th century, as well as old manuscripts. And there were just such beautiful inspirations for me that I ended up doing a exhibit more. A lot of the exhibit items came from um, the motifs and uh, patterns from the museum. And this was a garment that we made using traditional technique that is used in India called um, badla, which is embroidering with gold and silver thread. Next slide, please. And you will see more of the making of these uh, milagros, but these, this is one of the projects that, um, that we do with a group of women in India, and this is all you know, recycled fabrics and leftover sequins from our clothing pr production. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to talk about one project that I've started about three years ago, which I feel very um, comfortable sharing with you because, you know, for me, the transparency of the way I run my business has been really an issue that I've been thinking about. And with this project, I felt, because I know how much the each stage, starting from the woman make, making, I, I could really sort of follow the cost structure and understand how, um, how 
we were able to keep it transparent. Um, and this is, um, maybe I should read it to you, because um, this um, <coughs> is a non-government organization called SEWA, and it was founded in 1972 in India, um, started in Ahmedabad. And um, SEWA stands for Self-Employed um, Women's Association. And it is the largest union in India. There are one million members. And, you know, it's women only. And there could be farmers, salt makers, incense makers, and garland makers, or any, just about any profession can join them. And there are about 15,000 craft women. And it costs five rupees equals eight cents to join. And in return, they receive health care, child care, financial services, and they also teach writing and reading. And I uh, work with one sector of these women in Ahmedabad area and also Kutch, which is northwest India, or the desert area of India. And these women are mainly Robaris, and they are nomads. So, and this is one of the workshops in, in near Gujarat, which is about quite close to uh, Bombay, but north of Bombay. And um, this is a workshop the Sewa organization has built. And this is where, next slide, please. And this is beginning of a making of the Milagros. So next slide, please. And. Um, sewing next <laughs> and I tried to in our recycling process you know I try to recycle within our company but whenever I go into different um, factories or organizations I try to also recycle with what they have so we were stuffing all the these little amulets with cotton scraps next slide please and just to make sure to the sizes and shapes remain the same. We make these Xerox copies so they could check the sizes. Um, and also, you, there are a couple of women who are teaching the local women to make the pieces. Next, please. And still learning, learning, and sewing. And these. Um, Milagros takes about two and a half hours to make them. And at the end of the day, once they have learned, they take, um, we make these little kits with the machine stitched uh, shapes and with the cottons and um, they take it home and so that they could make it during their off hours or you know, during the day when they have not anything else to do. And what, one of the things that I think about is, you know, the kind of the work I do, I have to work with kind of thinking small scale, because a lot of these women don't have transportation. They usually walk, work, walk to the workshop. And um, so the projects, recycling projects I tend to do are very small. But I wanted to make it so that it doesn't become just like a tchotchke, you know? I wanted to do something and bring it to a level I don't want to say art, but you know something that you could appreciate more than just as a little piece of tchotchke. So I um, requested one of my Japanese clients to see if I could do a little installation. And this is the installation from Tokyo. Next slide, please. And this is one of the installations that we did from the Bologna exhibit. And we made about 2,500 milagros. And um, it hung from the lantern. And of course, the, the, you know, the site was so perfect for this exhibit. And I've always been very curious about you know, wonder of nature. So I wanted to create meteor showers. So that was the title. Next, please. Um, and perhaps I should tell you, so the, the way I, I work in terms of pricing issue is that we pay women for two and a half hours of work, about $2. And usually, you know, women make about 4 to $5 a day. And in India, 
the average tailors make about four to five, maybe three to five dollars a day, working anywhere between eight to ten hours a day. So you could just sort of imagine the amount of money that these women are making at home. Um, this is a project that, you know, traveling in India, you know, you can't help to see love the florals and patterns. And I wanted to sort of do a project where everyone, every one of the items that we make become one of a kind that also brings less monotony to the makers. So I have been kind of fascinated with, with handkerchiefs. So an idea of buying it on eBay was quite curious for me. So um, we started buying um, oh, handkerchiefs. handkerchiefs. And what was great was our accountant manager, Valerie, volunteered to do it. So I think she spends about, a, you know, about 32 hours a day and buys these handkerchiefs on eBay. And I also have a muse who is an artist and who is amazing at putting colors together. So next slide, please. And this is how we received them in the factory. And next slide. And that's Kimber, who is really arranging with her artistic eye. And this is what the laid out panels look like. Next slide, please. And we sent complete, we sent, we um, put it together and then sew them. And we send these to um, India, again as Sewa. And I chose to make it like a burst of um, pattern. So we bought Liberty Cotton. And so the base is Liberty Cotton. Next slide, please. And Mona, who is a textile designer who we work with, and she works there every day with these women. And she's laying out the uh, handkerchiefs. Next, please. Next, please. And we first hand baste them. And then it's basting, just to put, put it in place. And that's what it looks like after it's been basted. And then we lay out the pattern cut, and then it goes through a machine stitching. And then next, and then every corner of these handkerchiefs are whip stitched. Next, please. Next. <laughs> and I think we are short. Next, please. And that's the jacket. And what I, um, and I guess these women are, you know, to work with something that's beautiful and different, every pattern is different, I think also has given them sort of pleasure of working as well. Um, next slide, please. And we received them in LA and we washed them. And we also documented every single pattern. So every single jacket a consumer will, a customer will get has a pattern chart that goes with it. And we also wrote stories so, um, to make unique and one of a kind. Do you think that your, that your clients know when they find this jacket at Barney's or at your store for, I believe, 600 and something dollars? I'm trying to remember, what, it, what does it retail for, 600? I've Somewhere on there. Did you Megan, think that they you know? know what goes into it? Do <laughs> Megan? Do you think they sense? I, I th do I they think, know the backstory? You know, I mean, I've been doing, doing this idea of working for at least, you know, a good 15 years. And I think, I think people sort of know it by just seeing it. And these, I mean, last couple of years, I mean, um, we tried to explain and have information on the garment. But I think you just know it. You just feel, you sense I it. I think you just sense it, the, all the hand that goes through. And I think it's just part of our nature to understand when things are really lovingly made. I can't tell you why, but I could feel it. <laughs> Do you find that in, in your work that the most, the most 
sort of worked pieces like this are the ones that actually now connect more or the simpler pieces still do? Because you've, you've moved from doing quite simple things, you know, back yes, in the day yes. from like silk slip dresses well, to I, this level of craft. I think part of the reason that I've been able to do is got more complicated is because the recycling. When you're dealing with small pieces of fabrics, um, collecting and sorting and putting into an interesting form, it does naturally get more complicated, I think. And I think also it gives me a, definitely a more challenge as a designer. It's changed how you design. Definitely, because I think um, it's much more physical because I actually have to go through a lot of the scraps myself and um, because that's part, to me, that's the most interesting part of the design process is sorting. And um, yeah, I think it has changed. It, it definitely is, I definitely work more hours. <laughs> I should explain one of the, we didn't quite explain the depth of the recycling. Chris, at Christina's factory in down, well, at her studio, Called factory in downtown Los Angeles. They have all these bags of, of fabric scraps from all those years, from 2002. You said yeah, that. we. St I think we saved for a good 10 years. And so that every season, you and your staff make new yardages. They make whole new fabrics out of essentially collages and appliques of old fabrics, which then become the next season's cloth. Right. So that everything is recycled down to the last scrap. Well. We tried. <laughs> um, why do you think? Why do you think more companies don't do this as well? How do have the people look I to what you do? I think it's just so again? labor intensive. And you know, I mean, first of all, the whole concept of recycling is part of my vocabulary because you know I'm from Korea, and that's the way we lived. And I think. Also, you really have to have a team that, can under, that understands that concept, that you can't just buy yardage and just cut. I mean, could you imagine for a production manager to try to cost something out that we don't even know what scrap you have? And, you know, how, so I think it's very, very complicated. So, And I, I'm not even sure whether people even think of that as a possibility, really, as, as a production. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, I think it's much easier to turn to organic, for example, because then you just buy the organic fabric. But I think it's really difficult to think about recycling. Did you because also I think people have concept, the concept of recycling is perhaps not glamorous enough, you know? And I think the glamour is sometimes an important word in fashion. And let it's me tell you. It's usually an important word in fashion. <laughs> yes, I think so, no? So um, it's definitely not glamorous. How, how do you think you could make it glamorous? What do you think will change? What, what will have to happen? Because well, I think of what you do is terribly glamorous. <laughs> so I'm wondering, what, how, what's going to happen? What, what would change it? What would lift it? Well, I think this season, I try to make it so that it's, it's beautiful, but it's very detectable. So like if you see the inside, well, I'm working on the next line, which is our fall collection. And I use, a lot of the linings are all scraps. And it's just flurry of colors, and it's very exotic. So maybe that will make it more um, easy to understand at, at the same time glamorous. Because I think last couple of seasons that I was doing um, recycling, I'm not sure whether people really understood those textiles were remade and restitched. Right. Or whether it was just yes, they an couldn't applique. Quite, exactly. Whereas I made it a little bit more simpler so the customer could understand. <laughs> so we'll see. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if you could each, uh, I wanted to ask all of you, I mean, Adrian, you've addressed this, but Tom 
And uh, Kit, what do you th what do you think? What do you think the right shift should be in fashion? If everything is changing, what do you, what's the one thing that you'd like to see happen? Where do you think things are heading? Where people, would you like them to head? I think people should invent their own fashion, really. Mm -hmm. Just do what she does. I mean, yeah, that's my idea. You mean invent their own rules? Yeah, just, you know, that's my idea of making jewelry, is you can make it, you can do it yourself, you know, and pick it up. Okay, what do you think? Um, I, I feel the same way, kind of, because I feel like, I mean, for me, the only thing that seems really important is that uh, people follow their own direction and develop um, an individual voice, which I think is really difficult to do, but I think that, um, to me, I feel like when you look at, like, if you want to be a fashion designer, if that's kind of what your job is, that you need to figure out how to have your own voice, and I think that, you know, I think at least me growing up with certain designers in the United States, it's really been about appropriation. And I think at a certain point that's become really sterile and I think it's really important, especially in the U.S., for people to follow their gut and just kind of create things based off their own um, point of view. And I think that, that, to me, that's the only thing I really care about, so I hope that, I guess that's all I could really, I don't know. Yeah, appropriation is a big word, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Yeah. Or you can spell it. I guess for me, I think about branding a lot. Meaning, people always ask me, you know, why don't you do runway shows? Or I just think about giving style to women, and I think it's also consumers who has to be really conscious of how things are made. It's a combination of the two. I think really needs to happen and think about how we spend money. Um, and when you spend it, I think we should ask how things are made. Why is this price is this? And if we do, I think things will change and I think more of the style will come out, I think. Individual style, which I think what I like to do, what I do and what I like to see that go more that way is that one style one style really that everything will become slightly more special and more personal yes yes and, and personalize know. them personalize them yeah themselves. customize yeah customize your own things yeah i think it's where yeah. it's at i think that's what that is what the mission or that i've had at rogue in the last few years and something we believed in very strongly and certainly i have is that um as mona said that people should buy less and buy better and in buying less and buy better, they should ask the questions of where things are made, the terms of production, how things are made. And even if they can't quite answer them, you can feel, I th do think you can feel things in clothes. I don't know how to say it. That sounds very mushy and sort of wobbly-headed. But I do think that, as, as all of you are saying, people know when they've bought... I, I do think, Tom, people know when they've bought do you think? yours. Yes, they do. And I think that that's why <laughs> the First Lady shopping. wears yours and not the knockoff of you. I don't know about it. Well. <laughs> I would argue well, that's a few funny. drinks about that. Do, uh, does anyone have any questions but. for any of us, all of us? I think there's a mic that's like, there are mics. OK, there's a question. There's a question here. Hi, Sally. Sorry. Hey, hi, hey. <laughs> Nice W shoe. <laughs> Thank you. I want to commend you on. Um, I want to commend you, Sally, on your curation of this panel. I know some of you well, and appreciate all of your oh, work. Oh, yeah. Hi, Tom. Hey, there. <laughs> <laughs> and, Long time no see. <laughs> um, I think that you have a very unique panel of individual artists that's unique to Los Angeles, and craftspeople and um, real artists in a way that's different than maybe how this panel would look in New York. And I wanted to hear your thought process in bringing these people together. Great uh, job. Oh, OK. Well, my thought process in bringing them together, that's quite easy. Um, when I thought about doing She's something in LA. Choice, what? <laughs> Nothing going on. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to see if I get Tom out of Venice. Tom doesn't drive, actually. So on, no. This is an epic, epic road trip for him. Um, <laughs> I wanted to, I, I guess I, I feel that whether this was in L.A. or anywhere, the, the four people up here, or five, since your sister's not here, but we're going to assume she's here in spirit, are just definitive in what they do. 
that there is, there is, there's very, there's no one better in the areas they work in than these, than these people. And that each of them in their work makes things that one would, that are, it's not just that they're seasonless, it's that they're collectible, that they're things that, that grow in value as you own them and as you wear them and as you reuse them from all the jeans that Adriano's ever worked on to my, uh, everything Tom's ever made. There's nothing, it's, it's, that doesn't mean that you have to love every piece they do, but every piece they do can be, can be worn and collected and passed down. And so in a way I find that all of their work is issues of sustainability. I mean, that they're, they're a model of how to do these things and how to think about making things in which design is paramount, but also because they're, they're, the, they're definitive in what they do. Now, the fact that you're all here, do you think L.A. helps you be this way, or would you be this way if you lived in New yes, York? Yes, I think so. You think L.A. does? Oh, yeah. Why is that? I think, you know, because I lived in New York, and that's where I started. Um, you know, New York is a definitely very much vertical, and it's about being successful, and it's about success, and whereas LA is kind of horizontal, so it allows you to kind of relax more <laughs> and see the nature more, and it makes you kind of, it, it allows you to reflect, which I think New York lacks. So I think definitely for me, moving to LA allowed me to have a fantastic space in downtown you know, which mm -hmm. I couldn't even imagine having in New York City, no. in Garment District, or anywhere. And also the workers. I think we have an enormous kind of resource of skilled workers in LA <laughs> that New York, New York is also unionized and it's quite a different kind of garment industry. So it's less about Garmento, it's more for me, anyway, it's about being a designer. Um, yeah, I think it's a good place to work here. Yeah. Terrible place to run a business. <laughs> <laughs> no, I make, I make an example of I compare to my friends that are working in New York. And uh, we laugh about that because uh, they're telling me they work with FedEx in New York. That is not really designing. It means uh, that everything is almost done outside New York. And so you don't really have a complete control of your pro creative process. Mm -hmm. And what is uh, Christina saying is very, very true. In here we have a, a real manufacturing tradition and people is used to work really. And so you have uh, a, a complete step-by-step uh, -step process <coughs> in terms that you really can make uh, uh, a piece that is amazing because you can able to follow. I think we're doing very different things, but I think probably it's the same thing mm. for all of us. Do you think so? Is that for you? Do you find um, that? I just like it better here. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I don't, I mean, I really, I love New York, but the first time I went was right, I mean, I must have been like 26 or I don't know how, but um, I grew up in Northern California. Um, and I just, I don't know, I didn't really ever know anything else. And um, I don't, when I'm in New York, I just feel like the one thing that I think is better, at least for me here, besides just, I think it's just that I feel like my sister and I just do what we want to do. And we don't feel um, kind of the pressure of really having to go out. And I think in New York, fashion is such an industry, it's almost like, you have to go to parties, you're expected to do all these things, and here we don't do anything like that. I mean, I don't, I never do anything like that. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> yeah, this is like a really big deal. <laughs> uh, the message is out there, people actually want to hear it in some ways. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Do you sense that? Well, you know, I do a collection called The Standard Issue, which is sort of very basic. Um, sort of, you know, good old dosa stuff. And we offer it in both non-organic and organic cotton. And I would imagine our organic garment's about 30% higher. 
just because the raw material is more expensive. And I don't really see us, I must say, you know, our price is definitely higher than, you know, I mean, it's not really high designer, but I think our price is a bit higher. In the market I'm in, I don't really feel the diff people making, not buying organic just because the price is higher. Uh, I think people choose to buy organic because maybe they're, they're educated about what, you know, what organic versus non-organic. But I think our organic um, area is actually probably growing. And I'm thinking about actually letting non-organic go in our standard issue, just because of knowing you know, what it means to the environment. So. You, you know that there are. In the mass brands, there are now moves to do to work with organic cotton. I think Target right. is doing an organic line with Loom State. I mean, then there are issues of where things are produced and how they're produced and how right. you track the production process, um, which has a whole other set of issues involved. So, I mean, it's what's interesting is if you can find it all together in one piece and and how to do that. I mean, Christine's company is a model of it, but that that to me is the the harder questions to ask when you're looking for, you know, relatively low prices and something that is eco and ethically well, so I'd love to kind of just interrupt. Yeah. I think we have to question when things cost so cheap. Where they're how made. Exactly. Okay. I think Where that's what made. we need to question before saying something is expensive. How can we buy T-shirts at $3? I mean, really. You know, the cotton costs per yard minimum, I would imagine, is 2 $3, no? So I think that's what we need to qu ask first. How do they do that? How, how do they do that? Because it's a good trick. Isn't it? I mean, how can you sell a T-shirt for $3 when the fabric cost is $3? So somebody's not getting paid <laughs> somewhere. But I think the subject is... Um, much bigger than this in terms uh, because there's no question, uh, I tell you about my experience, uh, for sure there's no question that making a, a friendly product is much more expensive than using regular materials. Mm -hmm. I see two problems, first of all the price, but the second is also the look because fashion requires a certain look, the customer is looking for a certain kind of things that uh, sometimes you have a hard time to uh, arrive to that point with organic materials. I make you, for instance, an example on the jeans, all the washes. If I try to make a wash uh, with uh, a friendly process, I never able to arrive to the level in terms of look that I arrive using chemical materials. And for instance, I tried one time to do it, and the conclusion was that I was using 10 times more water than with the other process. So at that point, you make the, yourself the question, I'm doing something right, or I'm doing something that's just a marketing kind of thing. So uh, what I'm saying is, uh, what I feel today is uh, that uh, the organic thing today is mostly a, a, a marketing tool to try to get attention from the market. But our responsibility is really to have more responsibility in the whole process. That means uh, the way that you run your company, the morality that you have, the responsibility that you have, trying to save uh, uh, power, energy, and uh, to have the whole process that uh, uh, is more moral in some way than the past. Because honestly, I tell you the truth, I've been visiting organic cotton farms, and they do the whole thing without using pesticides and chemicals. But at the end, when it's time for harvest, they spray dioxin to get faster. Right. So honestly, mm. uh, this has always been the issue with organic uh, denim. You know, the final impact. I know where you work, and they still picking the cotton by hand. 
<laughs> but what you find in the store is not that. So it's really a long way to go, also because uh, the customer is not really ready. I'm making an ex a stupid example. You remember 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you was going to the grocery, and the organic apple was bad looking, and the other one was amazing. <laughs> Okay, been taking 15 years probably to educate the people that make sense, especially talking about food, to take the ugly one yeah. and, uh, and buy. <laughs> In fashion, it's going to be really hard. <laughs> okay. um, I think, okay, I get a, the, question, the question over there. Do you need a mic? It's a mic that's running to you. Uh, I just wanted to say hello to Tom because I, I ran into him at the coffee shop and talked to him oh, about hi. his shoes. Oh, you like my shoes, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't know the... Uh, They're organic. Oh, are they now? <laughs> Handmade. And there's a, there a young lady with him wearing a beautiful necklace I didn't know at the time, I guess, that you, uh, you made. Thank you. And uh, you'd said something that kind of piqued my interest earlier about value, that you value is questionable. Yeah. And that you, you find these things and you give them value. Yes, what you like, said, huh? Well, I mean, exactly, what, what, how does that accomplish? I mean, beyond maybe your name or position, but, like, what is it that gives it value? And then beyond that, you brought up the idea of integrity. Your imagination gives it value, doesn't it? So your imagination is mix it into something else. Right, but how do you, how do you convince other people of your position? I hope uh, they've got imagination to it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you present it in an imaginative way so that people get the story, you know. In that, in, in that sense, you also brought up integrity in, in terms of doing that, like what, in what you do and what um, Adriano was just saying, what is integrity and how do you, how do you ha run your business and do what you do and, <laughs> and, and have that integrity or, you know, maybe uh, what uh, signifies integrity, not just I, well, I think what are the signs um, of it. To be, integrity is to be original. You know, to, do, to stay your own path, you know, not to, what was that? Appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> it's a kind of dangerous area, appropriation. Um, stay away from that. Um, that's integrity enough. Um, running a business? Phew, I don't know about that. I don't know if anyone else on the panel. No. <laughs> Move on. Next. <laughs> on, on, Sorry. How run, on how to run a business with integrity? Well, um, well, I think Tom is downplaying. I mean, basically, Tom's like a genius sculptor, artist. So when he take when he finds a bit of glass from a fruit at the 99 cent store, like a oh, glass good, orange, and smashes it up and remakes it. It's just, you know, I have to, I, I mean, I say this as a, as essentially a fashion freak, but you know that? it's like, it's like nothing you've ever seen. There's nothing else, there's, there's no other jewelry like it. And even though it's made with a smashed up orange from the 99 cent store <laughs> that you probably also boiled or do, I can't remember what else you did to it. I it just it. looks more precious than even what Angelina Jolie wore to the Oscars. It has the colors more vibrant. It just does it. And you can't. I don't even know how to put that. It's you. you can't explain. I, I do think you can sense when something's really been designed by an artist, like when someone's really designed with with integrity, if that's the word you that I do know how to spell. That Tom doesn't think. Comes from years of practice. Um, and he's always had that in his work. And some people have it, and some people don't. It's not fair. Some you know, in the world, there's some people have it, and some people don't. And he has it. It's and for that, you, he can command. For costume jewelry, the prices that other people charge for real, which brings up pricing and all sorts of other things, but it's like a sculpture. I don't know if that helps. Um, uh, I guess we have a, no one on the side of the room. I feel like I need to geographically distribute these things. Um, there's a mic that's going up there somewhere, so. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm Ellie, and I was just wondering, the last few years I've been seeing the emergence of a lot of e-commerce fronts 
that are selling um, discounted luxury goods. And it seems like, especially now given the economy, a lot of big time designers as well as indie that are you know up and coming are all kind of um, merging with these sites. Some of these sites are very exclusive, kind of I guess um, the Madoff uh, victims are kind of going to these sites because they've lost so much money, but they still want to you know go out with the big names. Um, have you considered maybe um, uh, joining these discounters, um, or is it uh, you know just brand dilution? It's nothing that you would consider or even uh, want to get into. Do any of you on those sites? You mean like what do, what do you mean like Ukes or which of those sorts of sites? Um, there's like Billion Dollar Baby, Guild Group, um, some of them more exclusive than others. I think there's like Rue La La. Are any of you on those sites? No. Nah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that there is a, you know, there is a real question right now because there's been such diff deep discounting in fashion and s in, in retail and going into the uh, Christmas season this year, there were incredible, incredible sales, um, which started at the, in the sort of largest retailers and then by necessity had to trickle down to smaller retailers. And it, it was very, very destructive to the business. I mean, it, it might seem cool to be able to find something at 80% off in, in October, but what that means is a lot of people aren't going to get paid and a lot of businesses are going to go under. And I think it also then is quite confusing for the consumer because they don't really know what anything's actually worth. I mean, if something can be sold at 80% off, well, yeah. what was it made for, <laughs> you know? You have I mean, to you, ask yourself. you really have to question what the markup is. And uh, again, I think we have to move away from looking at, at price as being, I think you have to, people have to really think about price when they look at garments. Things that are very expensive can be very expensive for just the right reasons because they were beautifully made by someone who gave a lot of care to the design and people who were fairly paid along the way to execute something that was probably rather difficult to execute. And, and those prices are, and those prices which can often seem high are fair prices in a way. And I sort of would, would love people to consider, you know, if they can, spending that mo money without buying it. So to buy, to buy at full price the thing that is exactly the thing that was wonderfully made, that will, that they want and that they'll have for years, and that is, and that they'll wear or use or carry it for the bag lots and lots of times. And to not buy, you know, the six things slashed down to, you know, 20% or 15% of the original price, that they're not quite really sure why they like as much. I really, I, I've really come to believe in the full price kind of luxury shopper as someone and, and to encourage the people to, to, to question when things are reduced drastically. Uh, to, I mean, not that things don't go on sale, but like it used to be that sales happened, you know, in certain periods and they were a way for companies to get rid of that which they hadn't sold started. They, they didn't happen sort of a week after things arrived in a store. No. It's, been, it's been a very, very hard season. Okay, middle. Yeah. We have time for one last okay. question tonight. Middle, you, okay, you're on. Can we pass this down? The question I have, um, first of all, thank you so much, everybody. This has been wildly informative, even for an obsessed shopper. Um, my question for you, Sally, is I love that idea of buy less, buy well, but how does that best get communicated to the consumer in the marketplace? I mean, for those of us here, you know, we're wildly interested, but how does that get you know, adopted by the average person? You know, in a funny way, I think it's going to happen just because of economic necessity. I think that a lot of people who'd been spending indiscriminate amounts of money, even at sort of fast fashion emporiums, are going to have to stop doing that now. They are. They've stopped, basically. And I hope when people rebuild their shopping habits, as they will, because wearing clothes is fun and it's fun to sort of update your look and if it's it, and it's it's a, it's it's an, a wonderful and kind of optimistic thing to do to sort of you know change the height of your heel or you know you know put on a new jacket or something but i hope that when they do they they learn to look more carefully at labels and they also look in their closets now and think oh my god why did i need all that stuff like where was mm. what was that stuff and do, did I need a new outfit for every Friday night? 
and maybe I only need one thing. Maybe, this, maybe that's what the lesson that's going to come out of this year for people, that they only buy one pair of shoes, new shoes, but they have to wear it a lot. And they realize once you do that, when you have a little more money, you'll buy the right pair of shoes. And you won't buy the sort of six, you know, cheaper ones. I think it, it might, this, that might be a good shift that happens. I mean, it's something we've tried to convey to people, you know, for years in text. And I, 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 that alone doesn't do it. But then also when you see, even when you see the reaction to what the first lady is cho choosing to wear, I mean, the fact that she wore a designer such as Isabel Toledo, is a very small, for those of you who don't know, New York-based designer has been in business quite some time, but never, never in a, any sort of way that was bigger than she could handle, and never with any production that she couldn't completely control, and never in any way that compromised what she was designing. I mean, Isabel has never designed, you know, skirts just to have more skirts out there in the world. Everything she designs perfect. The fact that, the, that Michelle Obama would choose to wear something by Isabel on that day, I think you know, the normal reaction when a, a high-profile person um, wears an outfit is that people look to buy the knockoff of it really quickly at wherever, you know, for like the appropriated $119 version. You can't do that with what Isabel did. You can't do that. And I think that really what people will come away from the day is that she wore Isabel Toledo, the, you know, Cuban-American kind of couturier that New York has always been so impressed with. And Similarly, when she came to New York and wore a necklace of Tom's with, again, an Isabel Toledo outfit, this was during the campaign, I, I don't think it, I think she's a great role model. I don't think it drives people to think I'm going to get the, the knockoff version. I think it makes people think, I want to dress like that. And if I can have, if, that a person of style buys interesting things and wears them well, and maybe that's the lesson. Maybe, you know, maybe she'll help transform people's spending habits. I mean, at least I hope so. Um, I guess we have to stop now. Thank, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.